All right, so welcome back, everybody. We're going to begin our second session. Um, the uh, two philosophers from our first session are coming back for a sort of rematch, right? So um, we are going to hear uh, Dr. Grant Kaplan present now. Grant Kaplan is the Staber Chair of Theology at St. Louis University in the United States. Dr. Kaplan's work is primarily in Catholic theology, with particular focus on 19th century German theology, the Tübingen School, as well as John Henry Newman, but also the mimetic hermeneutics and anthropology of René Girard. He is the author of a number of books, including René Girard, Unlikely Apologist, Mimetic Theory and Fundamental Theology, Faithfully Seeking Understanding, The Selected Writings of Johannes Kuhn, and Answering the Enlightenment, The Catholic Recovery of Historical Revelation. Dr. Kaplan is currently helping to edit and write several volumes of the Oxford History of Modern German Theology. Uh, Dr. Kaplan's presentation today is entitled, All Desire is a Desire for Lila, Imitation, Desire, and Novelistic Conversation in the Neapolitan Novels of Elena Ferrante. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Grant Kaplan. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you, Philip, for the wonderful hospitality. It's a, it's a joy to be here. Um, so Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Quartet traces the friendship of two girls from Naples, starting with their girlhood all the way through mature adulthood. The quartet tells the story of modern Italy also, emerging from an almost medieval setting during their childhood in the 1950s to the beginning of the 21st century. Let me say a little bit about Ferrante. So she's been writing fiction for almost two decades, or had been, before the quartet appeared in a creative flurry between 2011 and 2015. Other than being from Naples and possibly working at an Italian publishing house, we know little about her. Some of her other books have been made into movies, and here you see the, on the right is a scene from the movie. Um, but it would be fair to say that the quartet is her crowning achievement. The four novels are both intensely personal, revolving around episodes like Lost Dolls, Classroom Triumphs, and student newspaper articles, and yet also robustly political. The characters in this poor neighborhood find themselves subject to brutal political forces, fascism, the mob, violent leftism, and within those claiming to uphold democratic norms, extreme corruption. And uh, all of this, again, is coming out of this post-World War II background. Coursing through the four novels is an unnamed secularizing force where church and family play almost no substantial role in forming the central characters. Ferrante's work has been compared to Karl Ove Knosgaard's My Struggle and has drawn the attention of both, or not only Hollywood, but also the literary world. So, uh, the plot summary, just I doubt many of you have read these novels, uh, so I'll go through this as quickly, but it'll help make sense of the analysis. So the setting is this poor working class neighborhood, a kind of ghetto so strangulating that its inhabitants can live more than half their childhood before they realize they're within walking distance of the beautiful Tyrrhenian Sea. At its, at its center are the two characters, Elena Greco and her best friend, Lila Cirullo. Elena is the oldest child of a porter. Lila is the second child of a shoemaker and the younger sibling of Reno, who apprentices at the shop and dreams of something greater. Another five or six families whose children are roughly the same age as the protagonists also inhabit the four novels. Almost all of the sexual relations and marriages happen within this group, and almost every marriage and friendship ends up estranged. Lila is the brilliant friend of the first novel, but her intelligence is less domesticated and her family is unwilling to support her intellectual promise. So she teaches herself to read at the age of three, but her parents refuse to uh, make the sacrifices to let her go past elementary school. 
Elena is the docile teacher's pet, and she's allowed to go on and study by her family. Lila ends up marrying the neighborhood grocer, who begins to abuse her already on their honeymoon. For Elena, education correlates to escape. She attends secondary school outside the neighborhood and against all expectations receives a scholarship to study classics at the University of Pisa. In the midst of flailing through her thesis, she composes a story inspired by Lila's childhood story called The Blue Fairy, for which Little Women was an inspiration. And it gives it, uh, and gives it to her future and mother-in-law who has connections in the publishing world. The novel, so written almost as a way of avoiding a dissertation, I don't, wouldn't recommend for the grad students here, um, it becomes a sensation and launches her uh, unexpected literary career. Lila, meanwhile, leaves her abusive, abusive husband for a torrid affair with Nino Serratore, Elena's longtime schoolgirl crush. Nino is a politically ambitious intellectual who eventually winds up in elected politics. His affair with Lila ends as abruptly as it began, and rather than return to her husband, Lila works in a meatpacking plant under bleak conditions. Another boy from the childhood, Enzo, pledges his loyalty to her with no promise of romance, and they make do in near poverty, studying computer science at night. Eventually, this pays off as they start a computer business, and it makes them a powerful force in the neighborhood. Around the same time, Elena destroys her marriage to a decent but in inattentive classics professor named Pietro by having an affair with the same Nino Serratore, who by now everyone but Elena can see is a cad. These decisions force Elena to move back from northern Italy to Naples and indeed to the same apartment complex as Lila. There, they raise their children together, Elena's three daughters from two different men, and Lila's son from her first marriage and daughter from her relationship with Enzo. One day, Lila's daughter mysteriously disappears, causing Lila's always fragile mental, mental constitution to come apart. She wanders the city of Naples, fascinated by its violent history. The intimacy between friends is like an Accordion. They grow close, they grow apart, close again, and then finally apart. Near the end of the fourth book, the narrator recounts 9-11 as the violence that has been part of her whole life now is spread to the entire globe. She is a mother who has placed work in her own desires of her family and the desires of her children, who now resent her. Meanwhile, almost everyone her age from the old neighborhood has died from drug overdose or violent death, and in some cases her friends have been jailed for crimes they may or may not have committed. The quartet is in short incestuous, as the neighborhood is a little world. Rene Girard spent much time reflecting on another little world, that of Marcel Proust's Combray. Um, I, I won't uh, read the quote here. Um, and I just want to suggest, before we get into the themes, that Gerard would have regarded Ferrante as among those true specialists in human relations. So let me explore three themes related to the workshop. First, foundational violence and its role in the emergence, according to Gerard, of all human culture. Second, mediated desire and gaining a sense of self. And third, the theme of authorship and the problem of an unreliable narration connected to Girard's notion of romantic deceit. So primordial violence. Girard writes, there's no culture without a tomb and no tomb without a culture. In the end, the tomb is the first and only cultural symbol. The above ground tomb does not have to be invented. It is the pile of stones in which the victims of unanimous stoning are buried. It is the first pyramid. No matter how dark it appears when first announced, Girard's theory of the scapegoat is not a metaphysic of violence, but instead a theory of fallen human culture. Cultures are built upon victims, and both myths and rituals find different means to cover up this violence. The city of Ferrante's 
Naples, or the violence of Ferrante's Naples is both open and hidden. It's in the streets, but also within homes. The narrator describes her childhood as follows. It was full of violence. Of course I would have liked the nice manners that the teacher and the priest preached, but I felt that these were not suited to our neighborhood, even if you were a girl. She goes on to imagine how tiny animals have entered the water, quote, making our mothers, our grandmothers, as angry as starving dogs, leading to a rage that had no end. Naples serves as a metonym for human culture or human society as a whole. To be born in Naples is, quote, to have always known almost instinctively what today everyone is beginning to claim, that the dream of unlimited progress is in reality a nightmare of savagery and death, end quote. The neighborhood communist Pascal Peluso explains these facts to young Lila with great effect. His father's in, in jail for allegedly murdering someone um, but the person he murdered belongs to the Camorists, or organized crime. And in Pascal's words, he had been a spy for Nazi fascists. After hearing the backstory, Lila cannot see this bloody history of the neighborhood. She cannot unsee the bloody history of the neighborhood. On the dusty streets, quote, just there, to most eyes, Lila, through Pascal, now comes to imagine how they cover up victims. This is the quote. On these stones, they marched and gave the fascist salute. On the corner, they inflicted beatings. These people's money come from the hunger of others. This car was bought by selling rotten meat on the black market. Behind that bar is the Camorra, smuggling, loan sharking. Lila cannot forget the history and contrast her own desire to remember victims with the attitude of her parents and everyone else. They thought that what had happened before was past, and in order to live quietly, they placed a stone on top of it. And so without knowing it, they continued it. They were immersed in the things of before." End quote. The narrator, Elena, prefers mythic concealment. She says, I hope to detach myself from that sum of the misdeeds and compliances and cowardly acts of people whom we carried in our blood. Gerard, remarks that the modern economy tends to dull sacrificial patterns by channeling this energy into commerce. Nowhere is this redirection represented more concretely than at the end of book one, when Lila and Stefano, her fiance, attempt to rise a step above the logic of the neighborhood, in this case by not recipro reciprocating or escalating against the rumors that Lila had been intimately involved with one of the dreaded Solara brothers. Stefano thinks mercantile exchange can replace, re replace the hitherto dominant reciprocal patterns of violence. Yet after buying the original model of Lila's beautiful new shoes that she makes in her father's shop and promising that he would not invite the Solaras to their wedding, Stefano not only invites the Solara patriarch to MC the reception, but sells the shoes to Mer uh, uh, Marcello Solara. And Lila, the end of book one, she looks up and she sees this person who disgusts her walking into her own wedding reception wearing these shoes that she made. And so she's stubbornly uncompromising and as they drive away to begin their honeymoon, she spits in her new husband's face and says how disgusted she is with him that he sold what he had promised not to, to the Solaras. And... Um, and then uh, her, well, her wedding night's just a disastrous rape scene. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's um, here Ferrante shows rather than tells the limits of a kind of market liberalism to control human nature and prevent crises of escalation. Despite Lila's disgust at this complicity, she eventually gives way to it, working with the Solaras backing to set up a successful shoe store. She uses the money she gains for good, giving prodigally to all her childhood friends. And later, when she starts her computer company, Basic Sight, she goes into business with the Solaras. Yet unlike a deceived romantic, who in Gerard's assessment pretends he's above the fray, Lila never loses sight of, the, of this complicity. She says, I earn this with my labor and Carmen's. 
but nothing is in there is mine, Lenu. Stefano, Reno, my father, would not have sold a single shoe without the money and the connections of the Solara family. And they're loan sharks. Elena again deflects. She says, when you're talking about what's behind us, what you're talking about is what's behind us. We are something else. The Pharisees in Matthew's Gospel, I think we have the quote here. Um, I, I, I won't read it here, but this is a quote that Gerard gets a lot of mileage out of. Um, so in the days of our ancestors, we know it. So Elena's failures, future failures, as a, as a mother and as a wife, take the bloom off this optimism. After trying to be nothing like her own mother, Elena now realizes not only she, but her daughter too, exists within a longer history. She says, the new living flesh was re replicating the old in a game. We were a chain of shadows who had always been on the stage with the same burden of love, hatred, desire, and violence. In book four, the story interlaces real events, the Erpinia earthquake of 1980 and the kidnapping and murder of the Italian Prime Minister Aldo Moro by the Bread Brigade into a micro history of the neighborhood. Now a famous author, Elena has almost always played to the crowd, yet the murder of Moro is too much to bear. And in a moment of honesty, she tells her audience the truth by calling Moro's leftist kidnappers murderers. The audience, for the only time in the quartet, rebels against her, nearly causing a riot. This crowd, like any crowd, wants its scapegoats and its victims to remain concealed rather than revealed. Meanwhile, Lila extends her knowledge of the neighborhood to the rest of the city, yet even its most beautiful sights mask something ugly. Elena recalls in the Neapolitan facts as she recounted them, there was always something terrible, disorderly, at the origin, which later took the form of a beautiful building, a street, a monument, only to be forgotten. In her childhood, Lila once played a game of throwing stones with the older boys, and she was struck and cut on the forehead by a, a stone or a rock. In her adult wanderings, she finds the site where prete, stones, were thrown to the death at Piazza de Carbonara, which became the place where men fought to the last drop of blood in ancient Neapolitan history. As Lila tells Elena the story, she whips herself into a near frenzy, while Elena immediately moves to dismiss the truth of discovery. Elena says, what seemed to interest and absorb Lila most was that all that filth was literally covered by a church dedicated to St. John the Baptist and by a monastery of Augustinian hermits. Lila laughed. Underneath there's blood and above God, peace, prayer, and books. Amidst this violence, Lila believes that the city is haunted by ghosts and dead children, including her own. So the next theme is borrowed desire. For Girard, Girard's desire is triangular rather than linear, and uh, we, we have this model of the other. And so although the girls share a reciprocal affection, it's clear that Lila is an object of fascination for the whole neighborhood. As schoolgirls, they together throw their dolls through a fence and into the domain of the ogress Don Achille, who's uh, later murdered. Together, they climb the stairs to this ogre's apartment and ask him to return the dolls. He claims that he does not have them and instead gives them money to buy another doll. They use the money to buy little women, which they read together in secret. This, as I mentioned, uh, inspires Lila's first literary creation, The Blue Fairy, which serves as a touchstone for Elena's first novel. After completing a, uh, the manuscript, Elena rediscovers the Blue Fairy in a pile of notebooks and rereads it, this short little book that her friend wrote when they were, when they were schoolgirls, and suddenly feels sick to her stomach. Quote, only at the end, however, did I admit what I had understood after a few lines. Lila's childish pages were the secret heart of my book. When Elena hits puberty, her breasts become a source of schoolboy fascination. One boy offers 10 lira to see her breasts and she complies. The decision is totally out of character for her, but she reflects. Instead, in Lila's absence, I put myself in her place, or rather, I had made a place for her in me. A few pages later, she admits, 
Only what Lila touched became important. When Lila, who had been scrawny and unkempt as a girl, finally matures, the attention of the neighborhood gaze shifts to her, leading to her fateful marriage at the age of 16. On her wedding night, the, wet, the reader, for the first time, sees what Gerard had observed, that mimetic desire can be a source of both friendship and rivalry. Unaware of how deeply she is in the grips of a desire for Lila, Elena, then a virgin, asks her boyfriend for intercourse in a public park. What drives Elena's desire is the thought that Lila is doing the same thing. What you do, I do, she thinks of telling Lila, which is the very same thing they said to each other when they threw their dolls into uh, behind the fence where the ogre lived. Later, when Lila decides to begin an affair with Nino Serratore during a summer at the beach, Lila does lose her virginity to a man metaph metaphysically closest to Nino, his father, Donato. So the Neapolitan Quartet is not just a novel about friendship and its risks, but also about writing and the effect of writing on reality. In book two, Elena gives her notebooks Lila gives her notebooks to Elena so that her husband does not discover them. Before destroying them, Elena reads them and a few pages later confesses. What could I become outside of Lila's shadow, counted for nothing? As a university student, Lila stands out for her beauty and her intelligence, first attracting a wealthy socialist and then her eventual husband from an elite intellectual family. In addition to the desire for intimacy, the adult Elena lives off the affection of her readers. Yet she's totally unable to judge the quality of her work with any reliability, and the reader has to tell her what her worth is. In the middle of her first pregnancy, she learns that her book receives an important prize. She describes herself as feeling that I was in a state of grace. In her acceptance speech, she exclaims, uh, that she feels as happy as the astronauts in the white expanse of the moon. Whom amongst us when we get a good book review? Uh, when Elena first meets her future in-laws, she finds herself dumbstruck at dinner as they freely discuss politics in the manner of sophisticated intellectuals. When she finally speaks, she borrows the words that Lila had once said about American atrocities. The Americans after Hiroshima and Nagasaki should be brought to trial for crimes against humanity. So Ferranti doesn't tell you this is the same thing. If you hadn't read the prior book, you wouldn't have, have known that this is the exact word that Lila had used uh, uh, earlier in the quartet. So Elena has no idea whether she's spoken wisely or stupidly. But when the family approves of her comment, she feels liberated from her origins. Quote, I was also glad that no one in this nice little family had asked me where I came from, what my father did. I was I. I, I. So in other words, the true self, romantically deceived, is, is unrelated, uh, is independent, autonomous. This scene of insecurity is understandable for a young student, yet it continues throughout her career. In her early 40s, she hears from an editor about her latest manuscript, when the editor approves, she writes, I was proud. In a few seconds, I not only regained faith in myself, I relaxed. I began to speak of my work with a childish enthusiasm. Ferrante makes it easy for the reader to chide Elena for being so brittle. Yet on the other hand, does any writer know the quality of their work? And is this judgment really as free from the crowd, from the readership, as we would like it to be? Lila writes for herself and wants nobody to read it. She scribbles away in a notebook. Elena writes for an audience. Elena transparently gains her identity, her I, her being, from Lila, but also from her audience. But is this different in kind or a million degree from those who more effectively conceal the same need for approval? The one reader whose affirmation Elena most desires is Lila's affirmation but she's unable to praise it. She avoids giving in judgment until cornered. And then she says, Lenu, none of what I read resembles you. It's an ugly, ugly book. And the one before it was too. Despite rising to literary fame on account of these books, Elena's own assessment of them suddenly crumbles. 
I felt bewildered. All right, I thought, I've written two bad books. Lila's opinion to Elena is not just an opinion, not the deficient gaze of the neighborhood, it's reality. Throughout the quartet, Ferrante shows both the strength and the fragility of a friendship that plays such a prominent role in the individual's coming to be. Although the two friends immediately reconcile over Lila's tearful confession about the book, Elena's existence as author in relation to Lila remains tenuous. So the last part, just on unreliable narration. Um, when we think about our lives, normally we have a kind of 1.0 romantic version if we think of you know, telling it. When our motives are always better than what they seem, the other person is always the cause of the problem. This version sounds like an attorney's closing argument to the jury and expresses a, a, expresses a variation of Girard's romantic deceit. Um, compared to the novelistic approach, the romantic viewpoint presents a subtle but key contrast, signaling a hair's breadth but a chasm's depth. At first glance, a number of factors make the reader balk at calling Ferrante's quartet great literature. She chooses to write in the first person and tells as much as she shows the interiority of her central character. Yet it is not a story of heroes and villains where the author wants more than anything for the reader to take sides. Even the quartet's most sinister character, Michelle Solara, is romantically involved with the town transvestite, Alfonso in his most brutal act of violence, where he punches Lila in the face, occurs at Alfonso's funeral when he's clearly grieving but can't tell anyone. The narrator generates sympathy, but also antipathy. So Elena's a, a, a mixed character. And the narrator tells the faults of certain characters, yet also reveals just enough to resist a romantic reading, to resist, uh, to make you think about whether or not the narrator is reliable. One character brings this out most strongly, P Pietro, her husband. He's a brilliant professor of classics, but portrayed as a remarkably bad lover. The couple wait until their wedding night to have intercourse. This is how Elena describes it. He was covered with sweat from his long exertions, maybe from suffering, and when I saw his damp face and neck, touched his wet back, desire disappeared, completely. She describes her bodily state during intercourse as hurting and unsatisfied. And an hour after they consummate their wedding, she wakes up only to find Pietro at his desk working. Nobody after reading this book will want to marry an academic or have one as a lover. <laughs> as a husband and parent, Pietro is aloof and inattentive, leaving Elena to feel overwhelmed in her new role as mother and unable to continue her career. She begins to act out by allowing innocuous flirtations that continue to escalate until she falls for Nino, Leela's former lover and her longtime crush. Elena's desire to leave her husband coincides with a creative frenzy to write a feminist manifesto about the invention of men, women by men. The narrator lets the reader believe that just as women would be better free of men, so too would Elena be better off free of Pietro. If free of these, she would be happier. She would become herself. But this isn't actually how it turns out for her. Since his politics do not align with the mood at the university, Pietro is shunned, especially during the leftist upsurge of the 70s. And he suffers an attack at the hands of radicals that hospitalizes him. Despite coming from an aristocratic family, he's not a snob. Uh, the rest of his family is. And when he meets Elena's family, he doesn't condescend to him. Instead, he shows a deep interest in them as people. Both Elena's mother and Lila are disappointed that Elena would leave Pietro for a man like Nino. Although mostly offstage and symbolic of an older order, Pietro is exalted in the eyes of the wisest character, Lila. In a tale of secularization that almost totally ignores the realm of the religious, Pietro, more than anyone, represents Christianity. Lila notes that Pietro speaks as if he were religion, religious, even if he's not a believer. In the context of recalling her first literary effort in high school, when she disagreed with a priest on the meaning of the Holy Spirit, 
So Elaine was having this conversation about how she had this argument about the Holy Spirit. Pietro unleashes a long, seemingly a Hegelian interpretation of the Holy Spirit and human community, and even re references a more inclusive notion of sanctification articulated by the prophet Joel. Um, not a lot of female prophecy in scripture, but uh, he, this, is, this is what he highlights. Nino, who had feigned friendship with Pietro only to get closer to Elena, is now a guest in their house. Yet he replies ironically after this beautiful monologue, I bet there's a priest hiding in you. And he says to Elena, are you a wife or a priest's housekeeper? Rather than responding in kind to these subsequent aggressions and manners, Pietro retreats into silence. Just before this episode, he and Elena end up giving refuge to her childhood friend, Pascal, who has taken up arms. Despite receiving hospitality, Pascal and his girlfriend rudely condescend to their hosts and mock any work not directly aimed at revolutionary outcome. Pietro remarks to Elena, someone who talks like that about intellectual work is a fascist, even if he doesn't know it yet. Soon afterward, Pietro ends up in jail for murder. So he is then both priest and prophet. In both instances, however, Pietro relents in conversations to men who bully him, either through insult or sophistry. Eventually, Pietro and Elena's daughters will leave their mother and move to be with their father in Boston, who's taken a position at Harvard. In the text of the novel, however, Pietro is never redeemed, and Elena never remorseful about how she treats him. The reader is left to pick up the breadcrumbs. So there's a lot of books inside the books, and the most essential is the aforementioned book on feminism. But I wanted just to briefly, since we're you know, close to Dublin, um, talk about the scene from Joyce's Ulysses, specifically the scene of Shakespearean interpretation. So Stephen Day Dallas gives this lecture, and he suggests an autobiographical basis for Shakespeare's recurring theme of love triangles. And so I mean, we have it here in the middle, um, where he says, you know, you're a delusion. You have brought us all this way to show us a French triangle. Do you believe your own theory? And this is the title of one of Girard's chapters in the Shakespeare book, Do You Believe Your Own Theory? And Stephen meekly replies, no, and for Girard, he's giving into the crowd. Uh, and, uh, and he later prays for belief. So this phrase is as I mentioned, the title given to the chapter in Gerard's book on Shakespeare. Thank you. So, her essay on feminism reflects the morality tale of modern emancipatory secularism, emerging from the fascism of Mussolini, which is really just the latest iteration of millennia-long authoritarianism underwritten by oppressive, undemocratic, and misogynistic Roman Catholicism. Post-war Italy and the neighborhood in Naples marches forward into the daylight of enlightened secular values. There was no greater instance of hypocrisy in the Italian church than its valuation of the family. Here the church forbade divorce and exalted the Madonna, but abetted a culture that scorned, beat, and abused any woman who failed to live up to this idea. The setting, one learns quickly, is ripe soil for the tale of secular emancipation. The quartet reflects these oppressive mores in a number of ways, from detailing the beatings that almost every female character suffers to relating how Lila, after a marriage, came to be regarded as a witch whore by the other women in the neighborhood. To bring the point home, the name of the church in the Naples neighborhood is the Church of the Holy Family. Uh, the only person we read about going to church regularly is the lecherous Donato Satore, Nino's father, a serial womanizer who sexually assaulted Elena just before she turned 15. Uh, so uh, nowhere does the secularizing push appear more starkly than when Elena decides on a civil marriage to Pietro. Her family is horrified at the suggestion. They berate her through the night. After this explosion, she confesses to herself, for at least 10 years, the god of childhood, already fairly weak, had been pushed aside like an old, sick person and I felt no need for the sanctity of marriage. This confession becomes prophetic when her marriage crumbles. Um, and so there is this uh, um, kind of 
novel within a novel or narration within a novel. And she talks about in this essay or uh, sort of memoir on feminism, uh, she starts with the biblical creation account and, um, and she, she discovers everywhere female automatons created by men. Pietro is too riz busy to read the manuscript, but Nino does and he says, um, and as she writes it, you know, she shows him a little draft and then he encourages her and, uh, and she says that, you know, I was really writing it for him. So the very autonomy she's praising in the book is revealed through this subtle narration to be a kind of uh, something to, to gain the attention of this man who a few pages later becomes a, uh, a, a, her lover. And so she, um, what Elena describes is a female condition. So she says, she herself in herself doesn't know what she is. She has pliable features. She doesn't possess her own language. She doesn't even have a spirit or logic of her own. She loses her shape, shape entirely. So this is not a female condition, but the human condition of dependency and relationality, where one's sense of self is always derivative of another. Uh, but they describe this in the book as a terrible condition. And so she later admits, like Daedalus, that she did not believe in her own theory. In the midst of her affair with Nino, she writes, although I now wrote about women's autonomy and discussed it everywhere, I did not know how to live without his body. I'll just read the, the last paragraph here. Um, the lack of much grace or forgiveness or redemption in the Neapolitan Quartet should not mean that one cannot construct a Christian reading of the text. It's a fictional world, granted a very realistic simulacrum of a real world, but still a fiction. And in fictional worlds, as Tolkien and Lewis have taught us, one can imagine them with different rules. So Ferrante's Naples is a godless world, one with telephones and cars and eventually computers, but one without a God who so loves the world that he would give his only son so that the world might be saved through him. Absent God, not even technology or computers or the most ardent idealism of all the students in the book can give us an answer to the question of what we are made to be. Thank you. So Dr. Kaplan, thank you very much. That was fascinating. And um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. William Desmond to give a response. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> The, it's a, the, thank you very much. Really, a very rich paper dealing with a very rich uh, work of literature. Um, I felt at a disadvantage because I hadn't read the book books, but I reached back into my memory and I realised that I had watched a version of some parts of it in an Italian. It's not quite a soap opera, but it was elevated soap opera, so to say, that covered many of the events. So I felt I wasn't completely cut out, cut off from the intimacy of unfolding in the family circle, the violence, inside and outside the family, out in the piazza and so on. Um, the, the TV version of it is dramatically very uh, engaging and I certainly would recommend it. I, you, you probably know it, but uh, uh, it's, it's hard to know what to say in a larger, perspective, but the last paragraph uh, talking about the God-forsaken character of the world, the lack of grace, the lack of forgiveness, the suggestion you make that perhaps some Christian sense of things might also be offered. Uh, reading through your paper and the things that you highlighted in terms of primordial violence, primal violence, it does raise questions for me uh, in a broader sense, but also in relation to um, uh, perhaps Gerard's sense of the sacred, which many of you will be able to address better than I, but the sense that things are founded by a violence that then is hidden 
and that notion of covering over a hidden violence that enables, in fact, a community to uh, continue. I'm just wondering to what extent you can so stress that, that you run the risk of not really doing justice to the fullness of human communities. And I was thinking while reading it that when we look back in human history, what does seem notable is that when human beings began to bury their dead, they also put in to the grave uh, little, sometimes mementos, uh, sometimes things that would help them in their journey to the other side. Um, that human burial seems to be distinctively uh, singular to human beings, but the burial is never just simply putting someone into the ground. Um, there is a sort of, I won't say cosmetic uh, aestheticization of the burial, except if one means by cosmetic something to do with a sense of being buried in the cosmos, that there's something more than ourselves at play in the fact of being buried. Um, and very much bound up with the fact that the human being is a, a creature of art. We create uh, artifacts and also works of art and works of beauty. And they're inseparable really from a sense of a sacred otherness that um, is buried in the ground with our ancestors. Now I'm only just raising that question because the sense of burial and hiding that comes across is one which is a falsification, essentially. It's not an act of reverence. Now again, I'm not denying that there are, as uh, uh, quoting Christ and the Pharisees saying that if we lived in the time of the prophets, we wouldn't have killed them and so on. There's some extraordinary things that, that Jesus says in those different passages and they're ab absolutely to be taken with absolute seriousness insofar as we do live on the graves of those who came before us. Um, and we exonerate ourselves in the presence from the sins that others did in the past. And of course, we would not do those things today because we're more enlightened and so on. But burial, the tomb, a stone is placed upon it. Um, and, and this, this is, a, again, a, as a, an amateur Gerardian, a question whether the tomb is just a covering of violence or an act of reverence. And I was thinking in the passage where you mentioned the pyramid, and uh, Hegel himself places great stress on the Egyptians. Uh, the Egyptians were significant for Hegel because they first understood the meaning of negativity as not just the last word, that the Egyptians had a sense that death itself was transitional, so to say, to something like renewed life. Again, not to get into the details of uh, Hegel, but the pyramid is the burial ground of the pharaoh, and if the pharaoh is not buried properly, the cosmos won't remain in balance. But one could ask whether the building of a pyramid is an act of violence that hides a violence. Fair enough, it's a good question. But something more is at stake than just violence. Um, something about the sacred balance of the cosmos. Um, and I, I, it would be interesting if in Gerard himself the reference to the pyramid had anything to do with Derrida because one of the early articles of Derrida actually had to do with the pit and the pyramid where he gives an interpretation uh, of Hegel's uh, discussion of the significance of the pyramid in Egyptian religion. Um, Hegel talks about history as the slaughter bench of history, the, you know, the history is the slaughter bench uh, in, in which the innocent are sacrificed. And it's a vision of horror uh, that is present in Hegel uh, as well as his more sense of rational teleology. But the sense of the world that emerges here is a kind of slaughter bench. Um, uh, again, as the last paragraph indicates, you know, God forsaken world, forlorn, without grace, without the possibility of redemption. Um, I would, would ask this question, 
if it, 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 a story that comes to my mind in reading about burials and so on is the old story of the bull of Phalaris. This is a question now again about the surface versus what's hidden and covered over. In the story from the ancient world, um, uh, a, a beautiful bronze bull is created and um, uh, it's a work of beauty, but it's an infernal work of beauty because the, um, those that are enemies can be placed within the bull and then a fire is built and inside the bull, of course, it reaches infernal heat and the person who is incarcerated in the bull is going to be screaming. But the fiendish part of it is that it was constructed such that you could put these, these aeoli, these pipes, into the nostrils of the bull and the screeches and the screams of the tortures would come out as sweet music. And I think that that's an absolutely fascinating tale, whether the surface of beauty and the harmony of the sweet music is merely the cover for a horror that is hidden. It's a story that I think has something to do with a kind of aesthetic that is quite prevalent, in my view, in, from the 19th century on into our own time, that beauty is the surface of something that in itself is hellish. And hence, that sense of the beautiful as calling us to something more than ourselves is a kind of, um, it's a swindle. It's a trick, so to say, a trick that is uh, distorting of a realistic uh, evaluation of the situation. I think this is, I, I'm not saying this again is a, a, a correct way to approach the novel, but I think it's, a, it's an attitude that is very pervasive. The surface of things is not trusted because hidden in the surface is something horrifying and hellish. Um, and beauty itself is uh, the seducer. It's a strange post-religious hatred of the aesthetic in a certain sense. We're familiar with those who say that back in aesthetic religions in the past, there was a hatred of the body and a hatred of uh, an aesthetic surface of beauty. But you can get a post-religious and an atheistic version of a different hatred where in fact the interpretation of the surface, uh, uh, we feel our superior enlightenment because we know that hidden in the beautiful is the, the horrifying. And I think it's a question for the, the novel also because it's, it's very striking to me that at a certain point you're really talking about the question of evil here and one could ask about the relationship between evil and the desire to be. Is there something about being itself that is evil? Is it evil to be? Uh, again, this would be a question for Girard, which uh, is, I think, not inappropriate, whether he would want to answer it or not, is a question. But in this particular novel, I found it interesting that at a certain point, Elena borrows the words of Leela to prote protest against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So there's a protest against evil, but again, the question that should come up is, in the name of what? What is it in us that says no to horror? If it is true that beauty itself, in the end, is only a surface that hides horror. I think this is, I, again, you, 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 my, my sense is that Girard himself imbibed of attitudes like that and worked his way out of them. But they still have a certain residual hold on him in looking at religious practices throughout the long history of humanity, not seeing the reverence in the burial, but seeing the hiding of the horror in the tomb. These are just some thoughts. There's just so, so, many, so many suggestive possibilities raised by the novel itself and your foregrounding of very, very important themes. So thank you very much for your Thank you, Dr. Desmond. And Dr. Kaplan, would you like to respond? Yeah, I think all, all those points are, are very helpful. Uh, just on the, the tomb part, um, I mean, I think Gerard would say that 
much of our, 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 our burials are reverent and pious and uh, attempt to uh, you know, acknowledge the fr fragility at the end of life and uh, uh, re you know, reverence for the dead. It's just the, uh, the original ones. Uh, and so it's, it's a kind of transformation of what was originally a kind of hiding or a concealing into then something that would be a, you know, what we would think of as a, a cemetery, as a peaceful place to revere those who have gone before us. But I mean, that, that doesn't really address the issue as to what is most primal. If the crime is most primal, then evil has a priority to good. That's why a reverent burial as opposed to a camouflaged burial of horror is an either or in a certain sense. Uh, if, if the beginnings of humanity are in that fall, and one could make the case that we are, our very being itself is already fallen, Heidegger talks about our being as a fallenness, but it seems to be a fall without a fall from anything that it itself had a primordial good about it. So how, how, do, how do we make sense of those things in terms of one's desire, if one does have the desire, to affirm a, a certain goodness to, the, to be at all, that the desire to be has about it a certain affirmative goodness that really can't simply be cashed out in terms of... Um, primordial violence. Yeah, no, you're getting at a, a, a key sort of point where a lot of Christians read Girard and they think he, he basically does what, you know, you could say Hobbes and Heidegger do, which is ontologize evil or fallenness. So fallenness is, is replaces creation. And um, uh, Girard, um, in many places, you know, lays out his account when it seems like this is the case. He's also ambiguous about it elsewhere and you know, wanted very much to affirm the Genesis account of creation of a primal goodness. But you know, in his book uh, uh, where he talks about evolutionary theory, um, evolution and conversion, I think is the English translation. Um, y you, know, you could see him kind of struggling with what we know about the development of primates uh, to then sort of, how do you then take the first human beings evolutionarily and you know, uh, sort of say there's a kind of blank slate of goodness when you know, we have this long history, m millions of years of animal violence which precedes it and uh, you know, whatever kind of primate violence uh, would have been you know, prior hominids. Um, so, I mean, this is only to, not to say that your, your objections aren't to be taken seriously, but just to kind of problematize how to think about um, uh, that, what that original goodness is uh, in light of, of the development of human species through evolutionary processes. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And I'll uh, open the floor for questions now, the same as the last session. If you'd like to ask a question, just come on up to the microphone. Gavin looks excited in the back. Do you have a question? No. <laughs> I'll take the floor again. Thank you very much. Uh, for that um, and it's on that point in relation to the primordial good um, not within a kind of phylogenic scene but let's even frame it within a kind of ontogenic scene um, where there is a human development of the subject um, and I kind of I think that in reading Girard this idea of an incipient logic that you get within Deceit, Desire, and the Novel. I think it, it's, it's fascinating, firstly, because he's effectively uh, describing the process of the novelist's conversion. And uh, he also recounts how he himself was going through that process at the same time. But after Deceit, Desire, and the Novel, when he moves into Violence and the Sacred, it seems that 
that kind of uh, idea of the incipient logic, that something is beginning, uh, and that it is beginning within the self, seems to be kind of somehow um, marginalized. So a kind of reflection on the self that is actually good, that some part of the self is good, um, seems to be somehow marginalized. And I feel it kind of connects up with this, this problem of uh, the affirmation of good, or at least within the subject and within the self, uh, an ability to be able to uh, come to terms with all of the negative mimesis and be able to tra uh, be transformed or become transformed, to, to initiate something there. Um, and I think it is, uh, it's an interesting point of tension there, and I think it does connect up with this idea of the prim primordial. So I mean, Gerard talked all the time, thank you, Andrew. I mean, Gerard talked all the time about positive mimesis. And so, you know, sometimes people will ask the question in, you know, high school history class or something, well, are human beings fundamentally, naturally good or evil? And I think Gerard would just say that humans are fundamentally mimetic. This is what makes humans humans. This is what makes the human brain a human brain most fundamentally is this mimetic capacity and it explains you know, all kinds of good things, our ability to acquire language, the capacity for cooperation uh, that's much, much higher than you would get in, in any uh, other primate species, but also our capacity for, you know, there's good patterns of escalation, but also bad patterns of escalation. And so, I mean, I think you know, Gerard has enough like good one-liner zingers that make him seem like a very pessimistic person. I want to go back to the bad, bad leave to the end slide. I mean, this is the last book, major book that he writes um, is, is uh, certainly, um, you know, uh, dark in a lot of ways. And what he says about 9-11 was also, um, I mean, there was that famous dialogue between Habermas and Derrida about 9-11, and I remember reading it as a graduate student, and then when I saw Gerard's interview, it's like, oh, he's, he, he's the one who gets it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I mean, the positive mimesis is basically what we're intended for is a kind of communion with God, and I think the mimetic anthropology is totally compatible with you know, uh, this natural desire for union with God. Um, and uh, it's just, it's, you wish Gerard would have said more about that perhaps, but plenty of people who work on Gerard work on positive mimesis and its capacity to you know, work effectively in peacemaking and these sorts of things. Well, I might attempt to frame a question if you don't mind. <laughs> Everything that I know about uh, Rene Girard, I picked up at second hand, so you have to forgive me. Um, could we perhaps say, I'm reminded of, um, of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. I know that Girard had an interest in Dostoevsky as well. That novel, I would say, also is very dark until the kind of final scene when uh, Raskolnikov converts in prison. Um, and then this later Girardian theme of the novelistic conversion that progresses through time. Could we say perhaps as a contribution to this evolving question that seeing the darkness of mimesis is the beginning, but if you finish the novel at that point, it's incomplete and the conversion at the end allows you to look back and see how there's kind of always the possibility of seeing the good in your mimesis all along, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I mean, Nietzsche read some Dostoevsky, and we, of course, know he had this tortured relationship with Wagner, and he has that line about Parsifal that everyone knows, you know, so what does he say, something like, you know, horror of horrors, Wagner has become a Christian. And uh, I think Nietzsche would have said the same thing, you know, if he went from, Notes from the underground for Nietzsche, just because a perfect 
uh, literary manifestation of resentment. Um, and we know, we know he was fascinated with this idea of resentment, you know, little petty people. Um, and uh, yeah, the, but for Girard, it's the, you know, it's the truest um, completion, you could say, of this process of novelistic conversion. I mean, I think for Bernard of Clairvaux says somewhere, you know, humiliation is the path to humility. And, um, and Girard, again, as three-quarter Augustinian, you know, talks a lot about pride and uh, this, you know, this collapse of the pride of the romantic hero is necessary to then, you know, sort of uh, gain the sort of humility that, I mean, we, we know if we know anything about the virtues that humility is probably the, the hardest virtue and it's the, you know, most uniquely Christian of the classical virtues. I guess you wouldn't even call it classical. And it's, you know, hard to, um, know whether you're virtuous or not because once you say you're, vir you're, you're or whether you're, you're embodying this virtue of humility because once you say, man, I'm really good at being humble, you're not humble anymore. <laughs> so there is this kind of paradox and I think that gets at the sort of tension of the life of a Christian who is both sinner and redeemed and, um, and that what you, 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 you know, a, a dark kind of non-Christian version of reading Gerard just has the sinfulness, the fallenness, and uh, that, you know, pre-conversion Dostoevsky. And then, you know, the sort of romantic, in a way, is just uh, redeemed without ever fully realizing the sinfulness. And so, um, I mean, Luther was right, sorry. Uh, I know there's one Lutheran here, but I can't imagine he's super popular in these halls. But, you know, the simul justus et peccator, it's, it's the simultaneity of being saved and sinner. Um, and that, that, I think, you know, mimetic anthropology kind of brings that out. That's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaplan. And uh, that brings our second session to a close. Thank you all very much. And we'll be uh, having lunch after this. Let's thank Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Desmond.